first question I have to ask you is, what do you know about me by just looking at me? Right. I have a disability, but my truth is I have never once used this cane. And I use my sunglasses just for the sun. So the reality is, this is how I present myself to the world. This is how I navigate the world. So now I blend in with all of you. But I'm a fraud, because in reality, I am visually impaired. And I can stand here and try to describe to you how I see, but I could only use words like fuzzy and partially erased and twinkly. So I'm going to show you how I see. This is how I see you, if the house lights were up a little bit. So you can imagine with this being my visual landscape, my visual reality, after I had my accident three and a half years ago, there are many things that I can no longer do at all, and there are many things that are challenges for me to do. But the brain is a miraculous thing, and I want to show you this is how I see my daughter. Because my brain etched the memory of her face, a face I saw every day before my accident, so that those areas where I see nothing, I can actually see her as whole. And I, as her mother, me, Beth, am in a sense whole myself. The core of me after my accident, being visually impaired, is the same. I'm the same person. But there has been some things that have changed. One thing that has definitely changed is the way that I relate to the world and navigate the world. But I think more importantly, what has changed is the way that people relate to me and also the level of help and support that I need just to get through my daily life. But I'm not really here to talk about the help and support that I need specifically. Ooh, I went ahead of the slide. There, I think I'm okay now. Um, what I'm here to talk about is that how we can help and support each other. Because I'm not the only one that's walking around with no outward sign of my disability. So many of us, I think most of us, walk around with all these wounds, this trauma, scarring. Yes, some of our disability is evident, but so much of it we hold inside. So we walk around amongst everyone else, and we are the same, but we're not. We've had many, many experiences. We've been through trauma, sexual assault, rape, violence. Name some other things that are traumatic, life-changing events. That divorce? Death. death, right? The death of a loved one? Say some. PTSD? What else? physical abuse. So there's a myriad of things that we've all been through. And if we haven't been through it ourselves, we know someone close to us that have been through those experiences. So what I'm here to really talk to you, to you today about and to discuss with you are some positive strategies that you can use, ordinary acts that you can become extraordinary helpers, ways that we can support each other. Because when people reveal their truth to you, Similar to what I did today, um, I came out with my visual signs so I could reveal my truth to you. What do we do? What do we say? How do we act? Because I don't think we can ever predict how people are going to act towards us or how we're going to act. What I found in my experience, and I was surprised, even as a psychologist and a life coach, of how people reacted, and a lot of it wasn't so positive. One thing people did was literally disappear from my life. There were people... I never saw, literally, or heard from again. Three and a half years later, they're still gone. There were many people that detached in a way where they didn't contact me for months and months and months. My best friend, one of my best friends on this entire planet, didn't call me and talk to me for five months. When I asked him why, he said, I was too sad. Every time I picked up the phone, I wanted to cry. So I didn't know how to talk to you and what to say to you. Another thing that people did, and these were the people closest to me in a sense, was to just pretend like 
nothing happened. That I was exactly the same person that I was before my accident. That I could actually see complete denial. I was on a vacation with a relative, we were at a hotel, and they said, I'm gonna go park the car, so while I'm driving around, can you look at the hotel room numbers to tell me where our room is? I can't do that. So these types of things are things I hear all the time and heard right after my accident. They couldn't accept that I had changed. Most people, however, were in a state of what I call kind of confusion, which is they wanted to help me, but they weren't sure how and they didn't ask many questions. And I, being newly traumatized, newly blinded, didn't really know what to tell them. So in this kind of don't ask and I don't really know atmosphere, people tend to just bring you casseroles. Um, <laughs> because, and I know many of you have been through this, right? When anyone dies and you come out of the hospital and you're sick, here's some food, and, and it's always a casserole, right? It's, it's, and I don't like them. But I had a freezer full of casserole. I don't like casseroles. I'm sorry, but for the visually impaired, a casserole is a nightmare experience. Um, I'll just say. The other thing people did is out of their uh, overwhelming need to help, and, and we all know these people, like, I really want to help you, I really want to help you, I really want to help you, that they tended to overcommit. So I would say, you know, I have to go to the eye doctor and I can no longer drive. Yes, I will take you to all of your eye doctor's appointments. I had a ton of those. And then in the end, I would hear something like, you know, you see up there, which is helping you has become a huge stress on me and my family because they overcommitted. Now, there are people that can roll up their sleeves and jump in there with you, and they seem to be able to anticipate what you need. And you have this sense that, hey, man, they've done this before, or they're really selfless, or they're just really natural helpers. They know how to do this. But I really am not sure that all of us are natural helpers. But I think we can be. I think there are more positive strategies, the ones I just described, that we can use. Simple, ordinary, specific, and yes, most of the time, pretty small things and small gestures that we can do to become extraordinary helpers to those that need our help and support. And that's what I want to share with you today is those things. And those things, by the way, are the things that allow us to overcome those feelings that we have, which are of fear, of not knowing what to do, and that icky feeling of discomfort we feel when someone around us has gone through something major in their life. So the first thing that I, well, I put up two, didn't I? The first thing I want to talk about is to just show up. Just be there. One of the things I really wanted people to do, and, and also don't bring a casserole, but just be there. <laughs> and just, I wanted people to regale me with all the stories of what was going on in their life, all the drama, all the chaos, so that I didn't really have to think about the ugliness and the trauma going on in mine. And preferably, I wanted them to feed me chocolate while all this was going on. Because people said to me that the reason why they didn't just sit with me and talk with me was because they were afraid that I was gonna somehow judge them if they did or said something wrong. And I know many of you probably know this when you come through a major traumatic life event or something big is you're so involved, your time and your energy is so directed on just getting through your day by day, you don't have time to judge anyone. I wasn't judging anyone. Somebody actually brought me the biography of Helen Keller. Um, but, but, it was on audiobook, so that was cool. Because there's really not much wrong that you can do. The second, well, my slides are just going crazy. The second thing that I want to talk about is be honest about the, the way that you feel and share that with the person that you're helping or that's asked for your help. Um, some of the things that people said to me, um, but later on, not right after, were, it really made me sad to look at you. I was pretty bruised up after my accident, and it made them sad or feel really vulnerable to, to look at me, and they couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle being in a room with me, or they were afraid uh, that they wouldn't know what to do, or that really they were scared that, man, this could have happened to me. And that really freaked me out. One of the truest things that people said to me was, man, what happened to you really sucks. And I was like, true that. That was really true. 
Um, I had a friend who recently uh, told me that she had cancer. And the first thing that came up for me was, I don't want you to have to go through that. And I said it out loud. And it was okay. So authenticity is really key. The third thing, which I think is probably already up there, is it? Cool. I can't see it. <laughs> so thank you for helping me. Um, is th think about what you can do to help and really think about it because what happens is, is as many of you know, and I, I alluded to before, is that when I was first blinded, I had no clue what I needed. People come out and say, what do you need? What do you need? I'm like, I don't know. First rodeo with visual impairment. Not really sure. Um, so I wanted people to make suggestions. So I think what we need to do is reach inside and say, what am I good at? Where are my strengths? Where are my talents? And what, where can I really deliver for this person and have a good sense of that? So if I really don't know what I need, you could throw out suggestions and somewhere in you throwing that out and in the opening up of the dialogue, I can go, yeah, that sounds good. I do need someone to move around my furniture. I keep falling down. That's really important. And then later on, when I was able to articulate what I needed, it was good to have people that had a really good sense of what they could deliver so that they didn't overpromise and underdeliver in that moment. And it was okay for them to say, no, I really can't do that for you. Woohoo. The fourth thing I want to talk about is to remember that healing is a long-term process. And it takes weeks. It takes months, it takes years, and for many of us, it's gonna take a lifetime. My disability isn't gonna go away. It's not fixable. Um, and so what I found, though, is that people kinda wanna snap their fingers. I don't know if you've had this experience, and they want you to be okay. And they want you to be okay quickly. Because if you're okay, then they don't have to worry about you anymore, and they can feel okay. But you know what? I couldn't really accommodate them. So, my point is not to shame or blame or push anyone to have a specific timetable for their healing, for their recovery, for their grieving, whatever it may be, because that process, that journey for each person looks different. And what they need in help and support, what I need in help and support also looked different over time. But I think what happens is our need to be okay in that pressure I don't know if y'all felt it when you've been through experiences, I felt it, but also our ability to be awesomely adaptable as human beings makes us be able to go out there and make people forget that anything ever happened to us. And I am the master of making people forget that I'm visually impaired, as evidenced by these comments up here. Um, <laughs> the, also, my... One of my best friends who keeps showing me hot guys she met the other night on her cell phone. Um, people tend to want to show me their cell phone pictures. I can't see them. Um, but the one that's the most interesting to me is when people get offended that I didn't come up and say hello to them. And I get this a lot. Uh, I saw you at Drip and um, you didn't say anything to me. I saw you at the grocery store and you walked right past me and didn't say anything to me. And what I have to keep, to, because I'm so, I've gotten so darn good at faking sighted. We, I think we all get so darn good at being okay for people. Um, and what I have to remind people over and over is, I still can't see you. I still don't recognize you. You have to approach me. I won't know who you are if you don't. And most importantly, I still and always will need your help in that. And the last thing that I wanna talk about of the five things, the points, is that to be open to your own transformation. Because I don't think we can help it when we're holding hands, standing with, standing by, holding up someone that needs our help and support. We can't help it but change. If we're attuned to the learning that can happen and the growth that can happen. So what I'm asking you to do is to pay attention to how you react when someone reveals their truth to you, when someone tries to rely on you, or hell, how you don't react. Ask yourself why you feel fear, why you feel discomfort. Where is that coming from? Can you be selfless in those moments? Can it not, just for a second, be about you? Can you be okay, and I found this one was very important, with what you have to offer? So many people kept apologizing if they couldn't help me in certain ways. Don't apologize. You should be able to feel okay with what you can give 
And you should be able to feel okay if I ask you something and you have to say no, have some boundaries, learn that about yourself. Because when I have something major or you have something major happen to you, which authors have called a life quake, if the ground is shaking violently beneath my feet, I am sending out tremors. You should feel those tremors. The people around you should feel their ground shake a little bit. And in that ground shaking, they should have to stabilize themselves and make themselves strong. So my point is today is to really talk about these ordinary ways that we, as ordinary humans, can become extraordinary helpers and support. And I want to end by having you, if you've been through any of these things we talked about, traumatic life events, disability, I want you to put your hand on your heart. I don't know where my heart is. Your hand on your heart, I'm kidding. I can't see you do that, so I'm, but I want you to look at the person next to you, two seats next to you, down the row from you. I'm guessing a lot of you have your hands on your hearts. Am I right? Okay. So that person needs your help and needs your support. And now I hope that you have some positive ways to give it and that you can truly be their hero. Thank you so much.